Abel James, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Thanks, man. I'm psyched. Let's, let's get going. Let's rock and roll, man. We're going to talk all about your new book that's behind you, your previous book that I have right here, and all the cool things that you're up to. But before we get to all that, how did you become the fat burning man? What's your story, brother? Well, let's go to this part since it's about exactly 10 years ago. That was my rock bottom. Um, and I came home one night. It was Easter weekend on a Friday night. And my apartment building uh, was up in flames. I lost everything. And at that point, I had been working my first desk job to pay off my college loans and was like really making progress there, but sacrificing my health at the same time. Like I was doing everything. I had great insurance for the first time in my life, health insurance. And so I had a doctor who was telling me what to do for the first time in my life because my mom was a holistic nurse, still is a nurse practitioner and herbalist. And so I was kind of raised in alternative health. And once I got this big, fancy, you know, medical health plan with my first big, fancy job to pay off those loans, I'm, well, of course, this guy has to be right. He's one of the top doctors in the nation, right? And so it was working combined with kind of that, that knowledge and I use air quotes from the doctor about health combined with running magazines. Cause I've always loved running and just kind of like the, the health information that was generally available from traditional media, as opposed to like the alternative wacky woo woo circle that I was raised in. So as I was trying that, I, I got easily over 30 pounds. I got high blood pressure, high triglycerides, pretty much all the problems that we were trying to prevent. I wound up, getting and then I really took a big hit and got really sick um you know partially due to the stress but also like being homeless essentially because I didn't have a place and had lost everything I was wearing fortunately I, I had other people's um, friendships at that time I was in Austin Texas and, and they were able to get together and just give me some of their old clothes to wear and I was driving around a rental car because like my car was out parked in front of it so I just felt like nothing about this was me and I looked in the mirror my face was fat and kind of round. And I, I grew up being an athlete. I was used to kind of like being in shape and being healthy. And I just looked at myself in the mirror. My life was such a mess that I'm like, all right, we got to figure this out. Let's, let's make this a project. And it was in really just the next one or two months when I put my research hat back on, because that's what I did as an undergrad, and, and really tried to research physiology, looking at bodybuilding because my older brother was really into that and looking at the guys who were able to do fitness competitions and get down to this crazy low body fat, totally shredded, but still have muscle and all that. It's like, all right, well, if those guys are doing it, then someone can do it. Right. And then you see, especially back then, like Mark Sisson, an older dude, just like crushing it with Mark's daily apple, looking good out on a surfboard with a six pack and stuff. It's like, okay, this guy's like in the later stages of life, he's kind of figured it out too. And um, so it was in, in kind of combining the Mark, I found Mark a little bit later. And now I'm, I'm thankful to say that uh, we've become friends and I've had him on the show a bunch of times and all that. But this was kind of like before the whole primal paleo ancestral health movement had, had really started to take off. So I felt lonely doing this. And I was doing the things that were supposed to stop my heart, right? Like eating fat, but also eating a lot of veg, uh, but not being afraid of dietary cholesterol anymore or necessarily salt. And, and uh, I tried doing cyclic ketogenic dieting for the first time and just like the fat came right off and the inflammation came right off my face. And within, you know, 30 days of me really taking it seriously, I had a totally different body composition that was better than it was when I was an, an athlete in high school. And that really made me mad because I had been trying so hard for so long to eat right to like, you know, wring out my pizza and put napkins on the top to get all the extra grease I out. The same thing. Yep. <laughs> you know, just totally. Going, going to every sort of crazy diet extreme, even though it's for young. And uh, so anyway, in violating that, doing the opposite and, and having it totally work, I'm like, man, we just need to get some real education about fundamentals here. And, uh, and so I started up the fat burning man blog website, then podcast and, um, and then, you know, now it's been over 300 interviews and many years coming up on almost a decade of, of doing all this. And I can't believe how much I've learned, but more than anything, it's like the, the most, the thing I'm most thankful for is the fundamentals that I've, that I've learned over the years that have been reinforced by so many different, you know, experts and, and regular people all across the spectrum. 
Yeah, and I've been following your work. Uh, I've probably listened to most of those 300 episodes. You, you put out a lot of great work. You're a great interviewer and you're so Thank knowledgeable. You. So I'm grateful that even though it was difficult for you to go through rock bottom and everybody has their different rock bottom, I'm grateful that you went through it because it turned you into researching, putting that hat on. And would you say that you did the exact opposite of what the doctor was telling you to do? Yeah, I'd say like at least 80 or 90%. It was the opposite. Not every single thing that doctors have to say or, or had to say back then were wrong, but most were, you know, most of yeah. the things were wrong. And he put me on uh, at first, you know, well, every time I went in there and I was going in every two weeks because my insurance was so good, but I learned how to read my chart and I, I saw the numbers get worse based upon following his advice. And, I, you know, it was, it was very interesting to see it not work. And also, you know, I took a step back and I'm like, man, he's like 40 or 50 pounds overweight, this doctor who's telling me all this stuff. And it's like, this dude probably has heart disease. You know, what am I doing listening to him anymore? And over the course of, you know, those, those weeks, and I think it was over a year working with him for a while, I was on a half dozen different prescription medications, including things like an antidepressant to help me sleep. <laughs> it's like, okay, maybe there's a different way of doing this. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I love that you were a free thinker and you still are and you had the awareness to to see that wait a minute this doctor doesn't look healthy and i'm taking advice from somebody i, I remember when i was in college <laughs> my nutrition uh teacher uh, professor she would walk into the morning she was obese and she would have mcdonald's in her hands every You're single me. every single class honestly wow. and she would teach on nutrition and i thought something is is off here uh, right. and it's, and that happens all the time, but not everybody will connect those dots and say, maybe I got to try a different approach. And we're not at all bashing conventional, the conventional doctors are doing, they're, they're doing what they've been taught. What we're or trying to taught. say, or not taught. Yeah. What we're trying to say is you got to be your own health detective. You have to have the awareness to, to kind of figure things out on your own, which is exactly what you did. I, I always share the, um, when I give lectures, I always say, okay, when you look at what mainstream media is talking about, when you look at the articles on Facebook, do the complete opposite, the George yeah. Costanza effect from Seinfeld. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you'll be down the right direction. That's exactly what you did, man. So I love that share. Good, good work. Sure. But now it's interesting because it's been enough time where like the marketers have definitely taken a hold of the words that the ancestral health movement made popular. And that becomes very problematic because especially the word keto, like this, this happened with paleo too, but it's even worse with keto. It's like you walk into the store, you see these, these products that are keto. It's got, you know, three, five, 10 grams of sugar in it. It's like, totally not keto. Nothing about this is keto. Not, like pretty much none of these ingredients. But because, you know, we don't have, uh, unfortunately, not that we need a regulatory authority to kind of enforce this, but like it'd be nice if we lived in a world where you couldn't just flat out lie about stuff. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, when you walk into the grocery store, we assume that, or, or when you buy online and, and, and those ads are following you around the internet and they've got all these fake five-star reviews, you assume that, that people are delivering on their promises. Um, unfortunately, we don't live in that world. And you do have to be careful because things that appear to be the right thing really aren't anymore. It's, it's bizarre, but you do have to watch your back. So to your point, that's what I mean. You've got to be your own guru. You have to build your own internal compass for how to navigate all this crazy stuff. Cause like, it'll get crazier probably every year. That's, that's the trend anyway. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's the marketing is brilliant. I mean, people are paid a lot of money to put this information out there or put these product labels out there to, to fool people and it works. They make a lot of money. So you're right. This yeah. is an important message. That's why your work this podcast and all the stuff that you're that we're both doing is so important because it helps kind of cut through that noise yeah. so you mentioned it re, you had all these experts on your podcast you have 300 episodes uh the fat burning man podcast by the way go listen to it if you haven't done so already amazing amazing podcast such a huge library thank you you said it yeah you're welcome you said it reinforced the fundamentals let's talk more about that what are some of those fundamentals that got reinforced I took a class in college and I went to an Ivy League school and it was exercise physiology. And all we did was work out on Nautilus machines. And um, before that, I had been working out on free weights. And after I took that class, which was I think two or three months or something like that, <laughs> I was less strong, even though I'd been working out like two or three times a week, I was less strong when it came to the free weights, when it came to actual athletics and actual stuff like that. And that kind of blew my mind back then. 
So when I talk about fundamentals, if you want to be strong, you've got to be balanced. You have to be, you, you have to focus on mobility as well. You don't just focus on strength. You don't isolate your biceps to get big biceps um, until, you know, you're at these super advanced stages of fitness competition or, or something like that. Then it might make a difference. But for 99.9% of people out there, it will make almost zero difference doing these isolated exercises, even if they are on big fancy equipment that your club has or your hotel has or wherever it has. They have those machines because of mostly like insurance liability purposes, not your health and strength. So when I talk about fundamentals, like my dad uh, growing up was a stonemason and I was a mason's tender and I'd have to take those five gallon fish buckets full of cement or water, or whatever, up and down ladders. <laughs> That's like functional training. That's functional strength. And also you've got something on the line when you're like dangling on the top of a roof with weight. You've, you've got to be strong and you see it as a responsibility. And, and so it was kind of embracing the physical fundamentals of how to move where, uh, you know, a lot of people are, are focusing erroneously on those isolated exercises or just chronic cardio on the treadmill all the time. And I had tried those, those ways of doing it as well. And it just didn't work. What works is strength training from your big muscle groups um, so that you can do a deep squat with or without weight. You can jump, you can run, you can push, pull, mostly things that, that move throughout space without isolation, you know, so kettlebells, free weights, or just, you know, lifting up things when, when you're guarding with correct, uh, gardening with correct form, right? When you go down, you come back up. Those are the things that work for fitness. And it doesn't have to get much more complicated than that, right? Like train to almost to failure so that you get your muscles to adapt, then rest. Rest is really important too. So I'm just kind of like putting the cliff notes of a lot of the fundamentals of, of movement and, and training that I've learned. And then, you know, on the, on the eating side, eating healthy, clean plant and animal foods and kicking out stuff that's manhandled by machines or, or mankind or marketers, you know, all the white sugars, which, you know, according to some <laughs> studies, that's more addictive than cocaine. Having yeah. never done cocaine, I can't vouch for that, but I can vouch that sugar is extremely addictive and cracks out almost everyone, kids, adults, old people, whatever. It destroys our health. So um, not that all sugars are always enemies. Um, there is no singular food that is the solution or the enemy. It's more a matter of finding diversity and balance and focusing on, on a bit of education at the beginning so that you know how to get enough protein, how to make sure your food is clean, your water's clean, um, that you're getting enough fiber so that your microbiome is also being fed and healthy. And just, you know, a litany of other little things like eat your greens. Everyone knows that veggies are healthy. Try not to get ones that are sprayed with chemicals or, or manipulated with all these genes that science doesn't understand uh, or, or that literally has um, a chemical pesticides engineered into, you know, the food itself so that it causes problems when you eat it. I mean, these are real things that you'll never hear from traditional media as being a problem. Um, even even when it comes to technology, we need to practice a bit of common sense. We've known that cell phones and the radiation that emits, that's emitted from them causes cancer and causes tumors for over a decade. Many people have gotten cancer, many people have died, yet so many people still just kind of have uh, these radiation devices close to their nether regions. We, we almost don't have a choice. That's just how everything's set up. So it's, it's also being able to be weird and kind of the alternative one who's uh, zigging when everyone else is zagging and getting used to being that weirdo where it's like, I'm not going to carry my phone in my pocket. I'm going to keep it over there and just be okay when people are mad when I don't re respond to their text right away or, or call them back right away. Cause that's just not how it's going to work. You have to set your own rules in this world where 80 or 90% of kids, adults and the elderly are, you know, kind of sentencing themselves or being sentenced to a life of sickness. And if you want to thrive, you've got to do oftentimes the opposite. Yeah, but that was right there was such great advice. So listen to that again and again and again. You just broke down the fundamentals. And I, and I love that because you just kind of curated so much of your research over the last few years in the last three minutes or so, what you just yeah. shared. So 
that was awesome. And I'm totally with you. Yeah, the same part of the brain lights up when somebody experiences a, a cocaine addiction and when they experience a sugar addiction. So in that scenario, it does make it as addicting as cocaine. Uh, and then there's no one food that's going to be the cure-all or it's going to be the destroyer of them all. It's just a, a having a healthy balance here and mixing up your foods. That's what I got around. Because our ancestors, they had to, they mixed up their foods based off of their environment. They were forced to do it. Yes. Now we're so blessed to have an, a, a, an abundance life that we could just go to Whole Foods, the grocery store. We could press Uber Eats app on our phone and have a millennial knock on our door 30 minutes with food. So we got to mimic the way our ancestors lived and our bodies will, will thank us for us. And, and going back to what you said about EMFs, I was just in Newport Beach, California at a health conference and I was uh, talking with Dr. Aaron Keneally, who's an oncologist from California. And I asked her, what is the number one concern you see when it comes to these cancer stats? One out of three people are getting cancer. She said EMFs. It's people wow. putting their phone to their head. Like you said, putting it on their hips, sleeping it with it by their head. She right. said EMFs are number one. Uh, she also shared, going back to the sugar thing, that a cancer cell has 64 receptor sites for sugar and a healthy cell has one. Wow. A cancer feeds off of sugar, which we knew that, but I didn't know it was to, to that extent. So right. those are some, some uh, really powerful statements right there. And I hope it made an impact with those listening. So let's get to this book that I have in front of me, The Wild Diet, which I love. This is one of my, I've read so many books. You see the books behind me if you're watching this video. This is one of my favorites because it gets back yeah. to the principles. And I read this a couple of times. I mean, I have it all earmarked. I have my notes and these are from years ago and I go back cool. to it. Oh so my gosh, I'll, look at that. That's great. Yeah. I'm honored. Yeah, dude. You love your work. Love your work. Thank and I'm you. honored to have you on here. How did this book come about? And uh, we'll get into the, some of the things I want to talk about in this book, but how did this come about? It came about, well, it's a combination of, uh, you know, a, a narrative description of how to be healthy in a book. Um, the internet, I realized this, so that book came out around 2015. And it was interesting, like when I first started with my podcast and the blog, a lot of times the first people who you'd find would be professors who did research on the internet, right? Because it was geeky back then and it hadn't been hijacked. But, but since then, it's really been hijacked by the marketers I was telling you about who just like use words against us and confuse everybody. And so I wanted something that would be offline where you could just have things that, that you know, hopefully would lead you to truth as close as possible in that book where you didn't need another book and you didn't need a cookbook or anything else because it's got like 50 of our favorite recipes right in there. So you'll, you'll have this resource for as long as this book exists. You'll have it and it will serve you and you can give it as a gift to other people and they'll be able to read it and, and read through. So I made it because there are a few different reasons. Like there's not a lot that's true out there. It's hard to find the truth, especially in a small resource. There are a lot of authors and podcasters and, and what have you who try to make things overly complicated and use big words and jargon so that they seem smart and try to put you down. And that works. You can sell a lot of people's stuff that way, but you create hungry ghosts and that's bad. And that's kind of what I was. I, I had been listening to the wrong people. I was listening to traditional media and all that. And it hurt me, you know, <laughs> I felt it and I never want to do that to anybody else. And so I did my best to put that book together written simply in a way that's that's relatively easy to read where you know if you're taking a flight or you're just you know you've got two or three hours you can blow right through that and you can be like wow i finished this book but hopefully you'll come back because it's more about the principles that are in there and sometimes you know just a simple sentence that i tried to whittle things down to is so much more powerful than you know a giant scientific study that that says that you don't really have to worry about red meat if it's clean. You know, like you, I don't go into all of the nomenclature and scientific jargon that might be in that study. I kind of try to make it clear what you can eat for breakfast the following morning where the rubber meets the road, you know? So I, I really tried to write it that way. And um, I'm, I'm thankful that a lot of people have gotten their hands on it over the years. Yeah. I'm thankful you made the book. I mean, first of all, the wild diet, Great name. I mean, way to snag that name. That's a brilliant name. Uh, and it exactly what it describes that it talks about the wild, what we ate in the wild, how to mimic our ancestors. I remember listening to, I remember listening to a um, interview you were doing and you were saying that people would come up to you in the airport and recognize you and how, how awesome that felt. But you, 
you met somebody who had your book at the airport who's going to Mexico and you're like, dude, you took my book to Mexico? That's so <laughs> awesome. I was cracking up. It's so cool. You, you, you started a movement. So let's talk a little bit about, I have some things that I wanted to bring up on this episode. You have uh, on page 106, I know you probably forgot some of this stuff. You talk about when to eat carbs and you say the best time to eat carbs is in the evening. Can you talk more about that? Sure. Well, I will say that there's no absolute 100% best for everyone. It really depends on what you're doing with your life. So I'll, I'll just start with that. But for me, let, let's start with the opposite. Eating carbs in the morning, mm -hmm. eating sugar in the morning, for me, drives me crazy. It's like it might feel good at the beginning, but then I am hungry the rest of the day. And it's unrelenting, you know, just cravings after cravings. And so I find out that if I eat carbs in the morning, or especially high glycemic carbs, I'm going to be pretty hungry the rest of the day. Now, if I'm going out and running a marathon, or if I'm doing like some big, long self-defense thing, I might have a sweet potato at 10 o'clock in the morning. But that's really the exception. And what usually happens is, uh, like today, for instance, I've already been recording for like two or three hours. I've got like another three or four hours after this. And I'll be having tea, coffee. Uh, with I really like grass-fed heavy cream. I might have a little bit of coconut oil. Um, probably later in the day, maybe before, maybe before my last interview, I'll switch over to doing a nice bone broth uh, from Healthy Animals. And then maybe some future greens, which is like spirulina, chlorella, and also green veg that's uh, been dried and powdered. Or I'll have a green smoothie, something like that. And then I eat dinner. And basically, that's my one meal of the day. And putting my carbs around that time, whether it, you know, it could be kind of like post-workout if I do a workout later in the day, um, in the afternoon. So getting carbs post that is really effective for refueling your body and making sure that you recover effectively. If you just kind of starve yourself after every workout, trust me, I've tried, that doesn't work out. And, <laughs> or at least it'll come back to bite you eventually. So you have to recover. So you want your, your muscles and kind of your insulin to be in the state where eating carbs won't harm you. So if you eat carbs early in the day, like most people do with cereal and that sort of thing, and then you don't work out, your blood sugar spikes, then it crashes. And then you're fighting that the rest of the day. Whereas if you avoid carbs throughout most of the day, and then you eat them later, when you get that crash, you're ready to sleep anyway. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the simple way of how it works in my life. But you know, keep in mind, Everyone has to work a little bit differently. And my wife, Allison, she'll eat earlier. But generally speaking, she doesn't start with carbs. You want to hit um, fiber, proteins, and fats before you hit the carbs, at least in my experience. And, you know, everyone knows what happens if you just like slam down something that's really sugary or if you just like slam down an orange juice. Like, try it. See how you feel in a half an hour or an hour. It's startling <laughs> once you get off that train. But I will say this. It takes a little bit takes a few weeks for your body to be like, oh, I can totally exist without orange juice. Why was I ever into that anyway? <laughs> right, totally. And I used to be one of those orange juice, bagel, cereal type of morning person when, yep. when I was obese for, for most of my life. Um, you're right. Once you start your day off with that, you get that blood sugar spike. It goes down and all of a sudden your cravings go up because your brain's going to think, oh, we're running low on energy and glucose. Mm -hmm. Let's go find some more carbohydrates. And you're on this roller coaster ride. So I love how you started off with this is not – a, a cookie cutter approach to everybody, but it's what you do, what you've seen in general to hold your carbs to later on in the day. I do the same thing. And you also talk about one of the best ways for rapid uh, fat loss is to exercise in the fasted state. Could you talk more about that? Yeah, I've always loved running uh, and mountain biking and hiking and that sort of thing. And so when you're, when you're out in the woods, you're not eating three meals a day, certainly not six meals a day, you know? Um, so for me, it's, it's really nice to kind of get out there and um, get moving without worrying about it too much. Um, oh, sorry. My, my internet just had a little blip. You still there? I, I'm still here. Okay, cool. You're good. Would yeah. you mind repeating that? <laughs> yeah. So you talk about, yeah. So in your book, The Wild Diet, you talk about one of the best ways for rapid fat loss is to exercise in the fasted state. So could you expand upon that? Yes. So as someone who is, has loved running for the majority of my life, it's something that I usually do fasted these days. And I've been doing that for about five or 10 years. Um, and when I go out for 
some sort of run. You know, it used to be I was running a lot, 50 miles a week, running marathons, and my needs for glycogen and sugar were different than they are now, right? And, and so bonking is a real thing. When you run out of sugar and glycogen in your muscles and your body and your liver, and you bonk out, <laughs> it's a nasty experience. Um, but once you learn how to manage that, and your body adapts to whatever you do most of the time, um, you can avoid that bonking by training fasted. You can also get your body more into a, a fat adapted state by not eating beforehand, by not filling up your belly. And, and you know, it's interesting because with some athletes, especially at the elite level, the issue really is, is shoveling enough calories in. Mm -hmm. But for mo and, and, you know, when I was training a lot, that was kind of more of my issue. But most people, once again, 95 to 99% of people aren't going to be having that problem. Most people are carrying a little bit too much extra weight or a little bit too much extra flab or, or what have you. So, you know, ask any, any fitness co competitor or bodybuilder, fasted cardio, fasted workouts will help you get weight off and especially fat off pretty, pretty fast. And it can be brutal, especially at first, if you're not used to it and your performance might suffer. So that depending on your goals and what you're really aiming for, um, sometimes it can be helpful to kind of give your, yourself that, that shot beforehand of food or of carbs to really hit your, hit your peak performance. But that's more for competition. Uh, so when you're training fasted, you're kind of getting this advantage of not needing to fuel with carbs most of the time. So it, it really depends on your goals, but I think if most people are honest with themselves, they're not at the elite competition level, they're at the lifestyle level. And that's where I'm at, that's where I've been for a while. Even when I was running marathons, it's like, who, who even cares about the fastest human in the world? You know, there are like a few hundred people who can really care about that, and the rest of us are kind of amateurs. And that's totally cool, because it's not about getting peak performance one time and getting a medal. It's really about like, how can we make this a, a healthy, balanced lifestyle for the rest of our lives? So for me, I like the simplicity of going out for a run or even doing my strength workout without having to prepare, eat, and then clean up from a meal beforehand. And also, I don't really usually feel the need to have some sort of powdered protein or, or powdered pre-workout, whatever, before I get out and do it. One thing I do do though, and this is kind of just like my little treat, especially if I've been fasting all day and I'm about to go out and run seven miles up hills or something, I'll just take usually like one or two little Manuka honey drops and put it under my tongue and just kind of like suck on that for, sometimes it lasts the whole hour when I'm out for my run. And it's just like the biggest treat in the world. And it gives me this, I, physiologically, I don't think it makes me run faster in sprints, but mentally, it's like, ooh, this little bit of sugar is like this is super juice. And so you can start to appreciate. Once you train fasted and you kind of get used to it and it's less brutal because you get used to it, then you can appreciate having a little bit of cookie or a little bit of Manuka honey every once in a while. And you're like, wow, this is something, you know? And, yeah. and also it doesn't kick off that whole thing where it's like you need more and more and more. Right. Because your body's not in that state anymore. Yeah, you reset your palate. I love that tip with yeah. the Manuka honey. Is, is there a brand that you use for that? Uh, it's on Thrive Market. They've got a few different kinds. One's got like eucalyptus. There's another ginger. I, I, I don't know the actual brand, but there are a few different kinds I've seen. Sometimes I'll even do like, uh, like an elderberry zinc vitamin C drop or like yeah, I've done it with a cop, cough drop sometimes. With those, I usually keep it in, in my pocket until I absolutely need it. Very cool. <laughs> they're gonna, good. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to check those out on Thrive Market. I, I, by the way, I love fa uh, fasted workouts. Personally, it's been a game changer for my health. Cool. I, I always, 99% of the time, I'm training in the fasted state. Because if we think about it, it takes a lot of energy and resources and blood flow to, to digest food. And mm -hmm. if we don't have that going on, we didn't eat and we go work out, then we have all, all those resources to crush a workout, to crush yeah. the weights, to get in a, a phenomenal workout. Uh, and I feel so much better when I work out on an empty stomach versus if I just ate something. So it works great for yeah. me. And uh, especially if you're going to be out running or, or moving a lot, like having all that stuff sloshing around, even a bunch of liquid sloshing around is not, is not needed and it's not pleasant. You, you find after you do it for a while. Totally. Totally. All right. One more thing for the book here. You, you talk about ingredients, which you spoke about on products that say natural flavor. 
yeah. what is what can that mean when they when we read that on a, on a package natural so it's flavor. tricky because sometimes it might not mean that much it might be totally fine it might be like some extractive of a strawberry or a peach or whatever but it might also be the extractives of the anal parts of a beaver or it might be like extractives from some sort of wood product that somehow has an oaky whatever that they concentrate into a bunch of other chemicals and wash it with all this other chemicals until it tastes like raspberry or vanilla or lemon or or what have you so natural flavors is better than usually artificial flavors artificials are almost artificial flavors are almost unequivocally chemicals and they may be somewhat inert, but they haven't been studied and they definitely interact within our bodies and our bodies are not used to them. Uh, so generally speaking, you, you, especially with your own foods, don't flavor it with like crazy food colorings and crazy artificial flavorings. Uh, flavor it with an actual strawberry or a frozen strawberry or a little bit of actual honey. And when you look to purchase foods, don't don't be too generous with your trust, especially at first, because like I said, natural flavors could be totally cool and not mean that much, but it also might be full of things that are totally chemicals or from the butt of beavers. <laughs> and I'm not making that up. That's been out and a meme for a long time now. And, and what's weird about that is the beaver butt extract, which tastes supposedly like vanilla, or raspberry, whatever, it's in a lot of products isn't even the scariest one like not even close because like at least beaver is a real thing that, that's kind of natural i guess but a lot of these natural extractives are just pure chemical soups so be really careful with that and be careful with who you trust and also be careful with the amount of foreign novel substances that are just kind of pulsing through your bloodstream at any time because that is another way that we get ill health or eventually conditions of the brain or cancer or or just our bodies aren't meant to deal with all of this stuff, especially when we're eating a credit card a week worth of plastic and being polluted by our air and our water and every, and our clothes and everything else. So we've got, <laughs> it's too bad, but we really do have to practice self-defense when it comes to what we eat. You know, it's amazing. I, I will say that we take so many punches, uh, he, the human body does in this day and age, and we're still able to function. It's, it's a testament to the human body. It really is. Yeah, it is. But if, if, but if you could start doing what Abel is suggesting and removing some of these interferences, the body will heal. You'll start to lose weight. We're not talking about counting your calories to lose weight. We're talking about removing the interference to lose yeah. weight. And I'd like to talk more about that. Like you, You've helped so many people get healthy and lose weight. What are some, some tips? If somebody listening right now, they have 20 extra pounds they want to lose. They've tried so many different things. What are some other things that you've seen make a big difference when it comes to getting healthier and dropping those last 20, 20 pounds? This is a big one. A lot of people go super duper restrictive from the beginning, too restrictive, so much so that like, it's impossible for that to last. What I would suggest instead is focus on the foods that you know are your trigger foods. Focus on the foods that when you're eating them, it makes you feel like you want to eat more and that you're hungrier, like the more you eat. When you get into that shoveling mode or when you identify those foods that might do that to you, try to go without that food for a little bit, for, for a few days, try to go longer, try to go a few weeks without that food. Try to go without that food until you don't have those cravings anymore. And just go one at a time. You know, it could be pizza, it could be cookies, it could be cakes. For my wife, Allison, it was actually at the health food store. It's really easy to find these loopholes, right? And I did the same thing, but they were carob covered almonds. And this is going back way years ago when we lived in Austin um, from the health food store. Carob covered almonds that are supposed to be healthy because it's like organic almonds and like organic carob or whatever, but it's totally sugary. But even more than that, it's like you eat one and you really want to keep eating. it. It's just built that way. Chips are built that way. Most, most common foods, unfortunately, are built that way because it's driven by capitalism and, and marketing. And these companies want you to be as addicted to their food as physically possible. And they're willing to go and literally trick your neurochemistry to get in there, put stuff in their food that tricks your brain into being on, I'm eating, I'm eating, I'm eating, I'm a consumer monster, monster mode, you know? So if you ever notice that you're in that 
that mode. Do your best to identify that as a trigger food and just like lay off it for a little bit. And then once you're able to lay off that, you realize that number one, you're getting a whole lot of benefit from it. And usually you lose weight and you don't have as many cravings. Then you find the next thing. It's like, oh, if, if, if these carob almonds were kind of a problem, I wonder what dairy is doing to me. Like if I'm honest about it. And uh, um, I, I remember even having Gary Tobbs on my podcast years ago and he had been putting on weight um, after not putting on weight for a while. Like it, it was totally cool for a while. And then he put on, I think it was 20 or 30 pounds. And in one way or another, he realized that it was the amount of heavy cream that he was having, um, usually with his drinks over the course of the day. So he kicked that out for a while and the 20 pounds came like right off. Wow. So even if the food seems like a good one, every, everyone kind of needs to adjust and find that way of, of making sure that you're not being hijacked. And when you are, just try to be honest about it, which brings me to my second point, which is Sometimes it's not as much about the food that you're eating, but the state that you're eating your food in, mm. the, the physiological state that you're, that you're in or the psychological state. So if you are used to eating while scrolling on your phone or your device through a feed, especially bad news, because it's hard to be present in your body to register the food that you're eating and feel as full if your attention isn't there with it. And if you're scrolling, you're almost always going to be in this stressed out state because these social media platforms want to keep you addicted too. So they put you in the addicted brain state that some of these foods do. So even if you're eating something healthy, like you you built this perfect salad that has all the perfect stuff on it. But if you're eating it and scrolling through Instagram or Snapchat or whatever, or you're just like looking at the news or watching the news, you're going to be all hyped up and it will be difficult for your body to digest what you've eaten. It'll be difficult to accept that what you've eaten is enough. And there's something to be said for the placebo effect, where you know, in, in medicine and in science, somewhere around 30, 40% of results come from just like, basically, if you think it's true, it's true, and you get that effect, you know, 30, 40% of the time. So if you can believe that what you're eating is good for you as you're eating it, And if you get into that rest and digest state where you're taking deep breaths and you're grateful for for the food that you're eating, it's going to be a lot more difficult to kind of abuse food, to be addicted to food or be taken advantage of by bad addictive food because you're present and you're with it. And uh, there's definitely something to be said for that. So instead of just, just kind of like brushing the placebo effect aside, it's just like, oh, that's weird. Why don't you try to work with that and really practice gratitude and practice your focused attention when you are eating. And it takes a little bit of getting used to. We all want to be entertained, especially at the end of a long day. But, um, you know, if we're honest about it, it doesn't take that long to eat, even dinner. You know, even if you're eating one meal a day, it doesn't take that long. So sit down, practice gratitude, and really enjoy it. Great tips. I I love that. Gratitude, it's the state you're in more so than what you're eating. Uh, placebo effect is super powerful. There's also the nocebo effect. If you think it's right. not going to happen, then you're yep. pretty 40%. It's not going to happen. Uh, great advice right there, Abel. Thank you for sharing that. Now, I, I want to talk about a situation that happened earlier this year. You uh, had a scary situation with you and your family. Would you be willing to share about that? Yeah. Yeah. It was the hardest thing that we've ever been through in our lives. We, this was in July and actually at the uh, rental place. It was a house and on the expensive side um, where I'd recorded a lot of the podcasts in the past few months and where I'd done a lot of work and also where we were living for a few months. Uh, Actually, it was about 18 months that we were there in total, but it was in July when we both started, my my wife and I and the dog started to get very ill and we didn't know what it was that was making us ill. But at the same time, the boiler furnace had started malfunctioning downstairs in the basement. The hot water had gone out. And so uh, the people who were renting to us didn't send out help to fix uh, the problem. So the furnace was having an issue for days and then they sent someone out and that person like reset it, that made it even worse. And since the unit, this, this boiler furnace unit was essentially malfunctioning, but running, there was a gas leak in the house and there was even worse a carbon monoxide leak throughout the house that was poisoning us as we slept 
And what carbon monoxide is, is basically an odorless, lethal gas that if you have it in enough uh, concentration will essentially starve your body of oxygen until you die. And as you get more and more poisoned, you lose the ability to speak. You can't get up out of bed and you kind of are overcome by this feeling of apathy, which is very, very strange. So the effects of, of the gas as you're being poisoned will make you dumber and less likely to make the right crucial decision to get out of the house or recognize that there's a serious problem because you just feel sleepier and sleepier and more and more drowsy until you pass out and die, essentially. So my wife and I were close enough to that state that uh, it's, it's crazy, but I was measuring it on my ring, uh, my, my health that's gathering health data as I, as I sleep and work out. We had two different air purifiers running um, that were also measuring air quality in the room at the time. But at this rental house, even though according to the law, you need to have carbon monoxide detectors installed on every floor, especially in sleeping areas. There were smoke detectors, but they had failed to install carbon monoxide detectors. And since it's odorless, you have no idea what's happening to you until it's pretty much too late. So anyway, we were at the point where, I don't wanna to get too much into it, but I, I couldn't get up, I couldn't speak, blood was gushing out of my nose. Um, <laughs> even worse things were happening to my wife. Our dog was very, very ill. And it took us a good four months to get back. And I'm still experiencing a lot of pain, a lot, a lot of pain in the spine and the lower back and neurological pain and, and, and sorts of things like that. So it takes an extremely long time to recover. And all of this could have been prevented if there were carbon monoxide detectors in the house, which cost about you know 15 to 30 bucks a pop. They're like smoke detectors. And in fact, a lot of smoke detectors you find now do have carbon monoxide detectors in them. So anyone who is listening who has a furnace, who has a gas burning stove or has anything that, that consumes or burns gas in their garage, in their RV, in their boat, in your house, anywhere, even if it's a hot water boiler, make sure you have carbon monoxide detectors because we almost died. And that is not an exaggeration. And it, it is the worst physical thing that, that has happened to me by far. And I was not able to work or work out for months. And uh, I really wish in a lot of ways that, that we hadn't had to go through all this, but you know, in retrospect, in retrospect, I'm glad that we have, because as we said, as you said, Ben, before we started recording, it's something that you just don't really think about. It's like, you know, they're a smoke detector, so of course we're fine. Or we're paying a bunch of money for this rental, so of course they've taken care of it. That's, that's the biggest problem that we made, right? Um, but also, you know, we had told them to take care of it, and they, they hadn't but kind of said that they'd had, that they had. And, and so that happens more and more often is there are lots of Airbnbs, homeways, and just kind of short and longer term rentals that are coming onto the market run by a bunch of companies that don't care about your health. They're in all of this to make money. It's an investment for them. And they sometimes fail to realize that there are humans living there <laughs> and that, you know, they, they will be poisoned if you don't take care of certain just, tiny little things like the furnace isn't working quite right. It can be a big, big problem. So make sure that you pay attention, you stay on top of it. And especially if you have kids, make sure you have carbon monoxide detectors. I don't work for a carbon monoxide detector company or anything. I get no, I have no skin in the game aside from making sure that what happened to us doesn't happen to you. Yeah, that sounds awful. I'm sorry you went through that. And I'm, I'm so happy and grateful that you are on the opposite side now getting healthier uh, you, your wife, and and your dog. I mean, huh, so terrible. And and thank you for sharing that. You you have the perfect platform to get that message out to so many people. And I know it's gonna save lives because it's something we don't think about. And it's a very easy fix. Awareness number one, action number two. So thank you for sharing that, Abel. I'm glad that you're getting healthier. And I'll continue to send you and your family some healing vibes and prayers. Uh, yeah, thank you. What are some things uh, real quick that you did? And I know you have a podcast episode all about this, by the way. So I'll put that in the notes. Uh, Abel went into detail on how he helped detox his body and how, what he's currently doing. Your mom's a herbalist. Uh, so what are some things you could share to help that you did that helped you get healthier from this poisoning? Yeah. So the first thing I did was fast for three days. It was very difficult to eat or, or really drink anything or do anything. So 
I, I did a couple of long-term fasts basically to um, help my body heal and be in that, that recovery mode and repair mode as opposed to uh, the cell divide mode. You know, when you, when you keep having calories coming in and you're in that fed state, sometimes it's harder for your body to recover from things that have happened to you and, and our uh, bodies were compromised and still our immune systems are somewhat compromised by what happened because it, it ruins your cells. Essentially it destroys your cells and kills your cells, brain cells, blood cells, like pretty much everything is toasted. So you need to be very nice to yourself. Um, this was hard for me because it was a neurological hit that we took. Um, so a bit like coming back from a really bad concussion from like a car crash or a football, you know, impact where two helmets hit and you're out of commission for a while where you, you can't push it too hard too soon. And I think this applies whether you break your arm or, you know, you, you strain your ankle or you have some sort of, sort of neurological problem. Yes, you want to be active in your recovery, but sometimes that means like being really honest with yourself and really conservative as you come back on the grid and as you come back from your injury. So like I said, like I didn't record a single episode for I think four plus months. I, I didn't really do any work. We were trying to get our life back in order because not only were we poisoned, we also had, had to find a new place to live. Um, and so our, our lives were really challenging at the time. So I had to take my foot off the gas. And when I abused it and kind of pushed down on the gas, and this happened to my wife too, we'd then re regress and we'd get sicker for a few days. So that was really critical. And then I, um, I've been into especially herbal supplements for a long time, but I didn't truly appreciate the, you know, the power that they have to detox and help heal the body until I, I was really, uh, really sick. And uh, pharmaceuticals come with side effects. And most plants and herbal medicines and, and vitamins, um, they may come with side effects, but not really. They, they, they come as closer to food than a drug. And so for me, I was fo focusing a lot on spirulina, chlorella, uh, and a few other substances from the, the plant and animal world that kind of help your body get rid of toxins. So not only were you know, we suffering from the carbon monoxide exposure for weeks and months after it happened, you're more susceptible to everything else too. Like for example, we would drive down into Denver uh, sometimes and Allison would literally start retching because of the air pollution. Like we had no threshold anymore. We had no margin to be even a little bit poisoned by our food or just like a little bit of exhaust here and there would just throw our whole bodies into this crazy freak out, like a uh, convulsing mode. So um, hitting, being meager on the food at the beginning and, and getting back in action with uh, milk thistle was, was another big one. Vitamin C, uh, vitamin D3, magnesium. A lot of these I take just daily anyway for, for health. Um, omega-3, 6, 9 combo. You know, a lot of these supplements are just things that, that kind of everyone, or, or not necessarily everyone, but a lot of people don't get enough of on a daily basis. So I, I like to supplement them anyway, but I was more strict about it. And we literally were moving from like Airbnb to Airbnb um, over those, those weeks and months trying to find a place because it was the height of tourist season in Colorado, in the mountains. So we were dealing with a lot of stuff, but just like rolling from place to place with two big old bags of herbal supplements um, and, and vitamins and mineral supplements. We were also going into uh, a naturopathic physician and, uh, and, and meeting with also like doctors and, and physicians kind of like using our network to try to reach out to people who might be able to help. But um, IV therapy was one that really helped um, and got me on, on board of like a little bit of glutathione and magnesium and, and vitamins in an IV drip going into your arm brought us back to life on multiple occasions, but it would only last for a little while, you know, like the glutathione, especially. So we can see it in pictures. We haven't shared these publicly because they're, they're pretty rough, but like after Allison and I would, would get IV therapy, which is essentially just a really effective way of getting these nutrients into your bloodstream. 
uh, even more effective than having it go through your whole digestive system, but more expensive, you know, and more in inconvenient. So like <laughs> we'd come in being really, really rough and really sick. And then afterwards, you could see the inflammation come down in the pictures. We would feel much better the next morning, but then, you know, the body would kind of be like, ah, you need another, you got to re-up now. So those were a few things. And then just eating as clean as we could and not drinking, not drinking. Um, I'm drinking a little bit again now, a, a beer or two or a bit of wine or maybe even a wee bit bram of, of scotch here and there. But it's interesting because I... Uh, I kick alcohol out all the time, like went a year without it. And I, I think it's good to do so, but especially when you're recovering some from something and I couldn't really work out also. And I didn't want to lose um, too much muscle and, and too much of the progress that I'd made. So drinking sets you back, you know, so you, you have to make sure, like I said, that you have that margin. If you're going to do those things like living in a polluted city or, or even spending time in air that's polluted or, or drinking water, that's not perfect or, any, any of these other things, you've got to make sure that you have that margin. Um, I'm, I'm happy to go into anything else because I know I talked about a lot of different recovery things on that show. Yeah, yeah. That's a great episode for the listeners to go check out. Um, I love what you shared because it's relevant to anybody who went through some sort of uh, part of their life where they got poisoned. So it, could, it doesn't have to be what you went through, but it could be a situation where you were extremely, extremely unhealthy. So you could add these things like milk, thistle, fasting, the IV therapy, uh, so it's a huge, huge process, but it's well worth it because it's helping you get your health back. And we have three minutes to go. So I want to nice. make sure I asked you this last question. And that's about the book behind you. Designer babies still get scabies. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about that book. The title is fun to say, by the way. So tell us about that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm glad you said that because uh, I tried to write this book in a way where it's fun to read and people can kind of sing these poems. Some of them started off as songs, uh, but basically in long form conversations like this where people might be used to hearing me or, or reading my longer form kind of narrative books, sometimes you don't have the ability or the space to get deep down into topics and issues that can be really ugly and scary. And so in this book, I kind of troll the trolls <laughs> and also get into a lot of health related stuff, spirit related stuff, life related stuff, but uh, I'm really glad that we were able to put this out on our own. It probably would have been censored by other publishers. <laughs> but since we did, uh, we released it, and it's been uh, a bestseller in humor in a bunch of different countries in Europe and South America. So I'm really psyched about that. But more than anything, it's a, uh, you know, I'm a, I've been a musician for a very long time. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't play, sing, and listen to to lyrics anymore. So this is kind of a way to to get these little lessons and thought pieces out there where other people can participate in it by reading them aloud to each other whether you're a kid not all the the poems are, are kid friendly but like a lot of the kids we were just at the holidays with with my uh, uh wife's family and a lot of the kids were reading the poems out loud the grandmother was reading and everyone in between so awesome. it's, it's a lot of fun but there's meaning in it too where can they get the book at designerbabiesbook.com. And actually, if you grab the paperback version, then I'm giving away free copies of the audio book as well. So, oh, very uh, cool. Yeah, the audio book is the most fun. And you read it? Yes. The audio? Yeah, awesome. Yeah, you got the perfect uh, voice for that. So that's perfect. I'm going to put well, that in the you. notes. Go check it out. Um, la closing words, where do you want them to go to check out your work? Easiest place to find me will be at fatburningman.com and also the Fat Burning Man podcast. And then if you're interested in this book, then go to designerbabiesbook.com. I can't recommend Abel enough. Um, I love your work. I'm so grateful. I want to acknowledge you for being so authentic, sharing what you've been through, sharing your knowledge with us, sharing it with the world. You're always showing up in this world, dude. And I really had a pleasure chatting with you today. And I'm, I want to say thank you. I enjoyed the conversation. This has been a blast. You are really good at this. I hope you know that. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you.